Welcome to Open Door for Sunday the 17th of May. Hope you've had a really good week, enjoyed the beautiful sunshine and uh, the, the cool air that goes with autumn. Mind you, it's been a bit cool in the mornings, um, but anyway, uh, good to have the heaters going again and maybe you've got one of those open fires. I, I miss our open fire. I really used to enjoy getting that uh, cranked up, but not so much chopping the wood. Well. Things are pretty stable at the moment. Um, we don't have a lot of announcements. We know that in about a month's time or thereabouts, we might go from stage three to stage four and numbers will increase in terms of who, how many we can have in the church. And it may be possible we could run open door again once that happens. But we'll just have to wait and see. Things change within a matter of days and once it gets closer and we're sure it's going to happen, we'll let you know and we will give you a date when you can come back. We're going to have to do lots of cleaning before and after, but uh, I'm sure we can get that organised. Otherwise, I guess if you haven't caught up, I should let you know that uh, Tom Melliger, who was a regular with us at Open Door, died last week on Wednesday afternoon. And uh, we're really, really sorry. Um, we've been praying for the family and uh, his funeral will be early next week, though again with the restrictions that will be uh, very limited to just family and uh, a few close associates. So please pray for Henny, his wife, and uh, their three kids and, and grandkids. Well, we're today going to be looking at a passage in Mark that has two stories woven together. There is the resurrection of Jairus's daughter and in the middle of that is the story of the woman who touches the hem of Jesus' garment and is healed. There are stories of two people who are in very desperate situations. So we're going to start with that idea and this is your discussion starter this morning, the, well, this morning or this afternoon, um, at the on the photocopy sheet that you might have printed off, it simply asks: um, Sometimes in life, we or others get into desperate situations. Now, that can be physical, emotional, relational, financial, even spiritual. What are the different ways in which people try to cope with a desperate situation? Now, when there seems to be no immediate answer to what's happening. Now, people have good, positive ways of dealing with it. They have some pretty negative ways of dealing with desperate situations. Just brainstorm for a few moments and see what different ways you can think of, good and bad, that people use to uh, deal with desperate situations.
So how did you go thinking through uh, the way in which people respond to desperate situations? There's lots of destructive ways in which people respond. Um, often people just get angry or blame somebody else or blame God. They sometimes uh, just pretend it's not there. No, if I ignore it, it'll go away. Do the uh, reputedly the ostrich thing with sticking their head in the sand. Sometimes people do constructive things. They look at all their options and work it out and seek people who can help them and so on. We don't often face really desperate situations, but in our story today, the two people that are the focus of Jesus' attention were facing very desperate situations. We're going to watch the Lumo um, narration of it, and then we'll come to look at these two people, the lady who touched the hem of his garment and Jairus' daughter. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please, come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. It's a really interesting story, and we're going to follow it through 
in a, uh, a fairly set pattern. We're going to cover three topics, but in each topic we're going to look at Jairus, then we're going to look at the woman, and then we're going to ask a question in a similar vein about ourselves in our modern setting. So the first um, series of questions are about the fact that Jesus was their only hope. Um, they were desperate and there was no other way forward for them. So let's think about Jairus to start off with. And the question we've got for Jairus is, what social, religious or personal barriers did Jairus have to overcome to seek out Jesus as a possible answer to his desperate need? Remember, Jairus is the leader of the local synagogue. That's a significant position, religiously, socially, maybe even politically. Yet he's coming and finding Jesus, this uh, slightly suspect rabbi who's doing strange things. What were the barriers um, Jairus had to overcome if he was going to look to Jesus to solve the issue of the sickness of his daughter? Two minutes. Jairus had to take some really significant risks um, in coming to Jesus. He was in a socially and religiously significant position and was given a lot of status in the community because of that. Not so much early in his ministry, but by midway and then later in his ministry, the religious leaders in Jerusalem were saying to people, if you go anywhere near Jesus, you're out. We're going to kick you out of the synagogue. Now, whether this was happening at this time, we don't know exactly, but I'm quite sure there was pressure coming from the religious leadership for people to ignore Jesus or to downplay him or to you know, say something against him. And Jairus has had to go against all of that in order to seek Jesus out. He just doesn't stumble against Jesus. He goes and looks for him. And so he's really taking a great risk, so desperate is he for his little girl to be healed. And I think, as we'll find out later, maybe relatively sure is he that Jesus can do something about it. Well, let's move on to the lady um, who touched the hem of his garment. We don't even know her name. She's a, a nobody. And the reality is she would have been a nobody in her society because she was having a constant um, hemorrhage she was unclean and anybody who touched her would be unclean and so she could not be involved in community and if her family were living around her 
um, and caring for her, they couldn't be involved in community either and certainly not in going to the synagogue or any of the religious um, ceremonies and festivals. So she was really, really on the outside. She was just background, ignored by everybody and probably kept very much to herself. So I want you to have a think about her. Um, the question is 1.2 and it says, what social, religious or personal barriers did the woman have to overcome to seek out Jesus as a possible answer to her desperate need? Again, two minutes. The, there couldn't have been a greater difference between these two people. Jairus, the, the synagogue leader at the, at the peak, locally in the social scale, and this woman, uh, unclean, um, ostracised, ignored. Her issues were really one of shame. How would people respond to her? She's got to get her way through the crowd to get to Jesus. And what are people going to do to her? Get out of here, rah, rah, I can't touch you. And she also has to overcome her feelings of, what is Jesus going to say to me? Is he going to respond to me as an unclean person? Is he going to heal me? And so while Jairus is dealing with other people's response, this lady really has to wrestle with the stuff that's in her own heart and mind about who she is and her right and her hope. Um, to get healing from Jesus. So different and yet so much in need of the touch of Jesus and the healing from Jesus. So moving it on, as we've said, to our own circumstances, I want you to think about the barriers that there are for people to come to Jesus today. Many people in our community get in desperate situations. All those things we talked about before, financial, relational, social, uh, physical, health, whatever. And in their desperation, they may be open to reach out to Jesus. But what are the barriers that stop them doing that? Have a couple of minutes to think about what gets in the way today for people who want to reach out to Jesus in desperation.
What's interesting as we look at the modern barriers is that they really fall into the two areas that affected both Jairus and the woman. Uh, there's the barriers about what are other people going to say? What will that do to me socially if I connect with Jesus? Which was Jairus's issue. And then the woman's issue were all the internal ones. And so people often have barriers about how can God listen to me? Can I get close to God because of all the stuff I've done? Um, and so on, their, their sense of shame or unworthiness can also be a barrier. So human nature really doesn't change. And even today, people tend to fall one way or the other, in needing to overcome barriers to reach out, to um, connect with Jesus in their desperation. Well, we're going to move on to the second topic. And in this one, we're looking at the faith challenge that Jesus raises for each of the two characters involved and then later on for us. So first of all, let's have a think about Jairus in the story. Um, Jesus says to Jairus in verse 36, don't be afraid, just have faith. Now, is that a challenge or what? Um, how the question for us is in 2.1. What was the faith challenge that confronted Jairus? Um, when Jesus said that to him, what, what was it that he had to overcome? What was it he had to do in order to display faith in Jesus? Let's talk about that for a couple of minutes. Put yourself in Jairus's situation. The, uh, the leap of faith has gone up. One moment he's thinking he's asking Jesus to come and heal, and he's heard of Jesus doing that lots and lots of times already. And now his little girl's died. And so it's not sickness to be overcome, but death. And Jesus is encouraging him not to be afraid but to work, walk with him back home and to have faith that Jesus can do something. And I think for Jairus, it was just the going home with Jesus was the act of faith. He didn't say, no, 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 you can't do anything about it. He held on to that tiniest of hope that Jesus was good to his word and would be able to do something for his daughter who he thought he was now mourning. But that's a, a massive leap of faith for Jairus, which he was able to follow through. What about the lady? Uh, quite different. But she too had quite a challenge that she had to face. And it was a little bit aligned also with her 
barrier, just as Jairus' barrier was people's perception, and here he is taking Jesus home even after his daughter's dead. Um, now the woman has to face um, the question from Jesus in the question 2.2. Jesus asked, who touched my robe? And all the disciples are going, you're kidding me. No, come on, there's a crowd all around you. But Jesus knows what's happened. But this is a challenge for the, the woman, a real faith challenge. So have a couple of minutes to think about it. How was this a challenge to her? It's an interesting challenge the lady had to face. Um, was she going to unmask herself? Was she going to face the possibility that Jesus would reject her and say, oh, well, I wasn't going to heal you. Uh, what are you doing? Um, was she going to allow the crowd to know about her? She'd lived with shame for so long, was so isolated. Now she was in the centre of the public eye. Um, the temptation would have been to sneak away. I mean, all the people who do the pictures, they have these dramatic poses of the, usually of the lady on the ground or kneeling and reaching out. But in fact, there's probably just a throng of people like the scrum in the shopping centre and she is just elbowing her way through the crowd and reaching through, quite nondescript. Doesn't make for a good picture though. Um, was she going to expose herself and allow people to know what God had done. Um, that was her challenge. Was she going to let people and Jesus know that the power of God had touched and changed her life and set her free? Well, we also have faith challenges. If you are a follower of Jesus, or maybe if you are going to become a follower of Jesus, the question is, what were the faith challenges you had to face or maybe what will be the faith challenges you have to face to be a ongoing follower of Jesus. Those challenges can change over the years. What was a challenge for us early on and as a follower of Jesus might become easy and then, wow, something else comes up. So I want you to take a couple of minutes and think about what are the faith challenges you face now or maybe you might face if you wanted to become a follower of Jesus.
It's interesting that uh, we all have a very different journey as we move into faith with, in Jesus and as we move along as followers of Jesus. Faith challenges don't go away, they keep coming. Um, but in different aspects of life, um, as our lives change and as our circumstances are different, so different things become a challenge to us in our following of Jesus. Jesus is always there wanting to connect with us and to bring us into closer relationship. But often to make that step, we have to take on uh, a risk, accept his authority or be obedient or humble before him in some new way so that he can act on our behalf. So don't back away from the faith challenges. They are the things that lead us deeper um, and stronger into relationship with Jesus. Well, let's move on to our final area that we're going to look at, and that's looking at the outcome in the lives of the, uh, the characters in this story, or the people in the story. First of all, Jairus. Now, obviously, he gets his little girl back, which is a pretty uh, significant outcome. That was certainly a change in his life. But I want you to spend a couple of minutes uh, thinking about what else may have changed. And 3.1 asks, what was Jairus's new understanding of Jesus? And how do you think that changed the way he lived, physically, relationally, spiritually, from that point forward? What changed for Jairus? Like many of those who encountered Jesus in miraculous healing or in some other miracle during his ministry years, we don't know what happens to Jairus. Um, we're not told. The question I guess for us is, did he become a solid follower of Jesus? Did he stick with Jesus um, through the, the latter years of Jesus' ministry when the religious leaders in Jerusalem were doing everything they could to destroy him? Was he one of the new Christians uh, later on, um, post Jesus' resurrection? We don't know. That was going to, that was the real challenge for Jairus, whether this would just be, woo, you beauty, I've got my little girl back and go back to life as usual, or whether he would change his whole way of thinking and see Jesus as Messiah and follow him. So let's have a look, think about the woman for a moment because there is the same type of challenge there for her. And 3.2 asks us, what was a woman's new understanding of Jesus and how did this change her life 
Again, think physically, relationally and spiritually. I think even more than Jairus, the woman's life would have been radically changed because she's been taken from being an outcast to now being included in the community once again, able to be part of a family in a normal way. Yes, her body is being healed and that great pain has gone and the, and the loss of income and, and all the heartache that it's part of a chronic illness had been taken away from her but she was now socially and spiritually re-included in her community and so her whole world was different and made whole. Uh, again, we don't know whether she became one of Jesus' close followers. Um, a lady in that time wouldn't have had the mobility or the resources that uh, the men would have had to actually you know, go with Jesus or be near him um, when he was teaching. So even if she was a follower, it would have been from a distance. Did she become part of the early church? We don't know. But again, she had that opportunity to take the leap from being healed physically to being healed spiritually and accepting that Jesus was indeed the Messiah sent by God. Encounters with Jesus bring about change. If there's no change, then one has to question, has there been a genuine encounter? And so we go to bring the focus back on ourselves in the final question and just have a little bit of think about our changes, 3.3. And it asks, if we become followers of Jesus or if we already are followers of Jesus, what life changes have or will happen for us as his followers? Are there things that are different in our lives as followers of Jesus that show that we have actually encountered him as Lord and Saviour? Let's take a couple of minutes to reflect on that.
just as we all face very different faith challenges because we are different people, we are in different circumstances, we are in different relationship networks. So the changes that God needs to work in us are often quite different. We all have different weaknesses that uh, he wants to strengthen through the grace of the Holy Spirit. We all have different strengths that we rely on, um, that he needs to wean us off so that we rely on him rather than on ourselves. But for all followers of Jesus, there are going to be life changes in the things we do physically, in the way we relate to people, and certainly in our understanding of the spiritual world and how we relate to God. And those are there both as evidence to others, but also to ourselves, that this relationship we have with Jesus is real. It's not just an imagination in our head, because it is reshaping, uh, reforming, transforming our reality. So we've come to the end of the uh, discussion for this week on uh, these two stories that are woven together. Maybe they've raised a question that you need to think through a little bit more. Take the time to uh, reread the passage and uh, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you about anything specifically you need to reflect on or change in your life. We're going to pray to uh, close off our time together. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that when we are in desperate situations, when we come to the end of ourselves in some way, you don't walk away and ignore us, but you are always there. You are just behind us where we can reach out to you. And thank you that when we reach out to you in our brokenness, in our hopelessness, in our fear, you don't dismiss us or belittle us, but you grab hold of us and draw us into your love, to your hope, to the peace that comes through knowing you. We pray that as we face difficult situations, we won't turn away from you, but we'll turn towards you and find in you the hope, the healing, the understanding that we need so that we can become your followers, so that we can remain strong as your followers in this world. Again, we commend each other to you for the week that lies ahead. We pray that you'll guide us, that you'll provide for us, that you'll be at work in us in ways that honour your name. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.